Good morning, Shady Grove. Good morning. When I was a kid, we used to say Happy Sabbath every morning before church, so I'll say the same thing to you, Happy Sabbath. You're all pros. These are our praise kids. Not, <laughs> not Polly, but she could join us. She's a child at heart. Only two of them were able to be with us this morning, but we're going to be mighty anyhow. They've been working so hard on learning some very tough words, and they're going to introduce you to them right now. Are you ready? Yeah. Are you all ready? Yeah. Gonna sing it I think the mics are on. Ready, praise kids? we don't have to try that. <laughs> They're going to know this forever and good on them, right? Good morning, friends. Good morning. Welcome to Shady Grove United Methodist Church this morning. Welcome to you folks who are online. What a beautiful day it is to be worshiping together. I'm Chris McLean, lead pastor here at Shady Grove. As we get started, won't you sign in? Uh, do that on your app, on your phone, or you can do that by the QR code, or we have a kiosk out as you're exiting. It's to the left, and you can get some help with that. All right, friends, as we get started this morning, I want you to think about somebody who gave you something, whether that was an example or a tangible object or a story that made a difference in your life, okay? Something that they had, they gave to you, and it made a difference in your life. And as you get up and greet your neighbor, feel free to share that or share your name. But at least you have something to talk about if you're shy and you like a prompt. Feeling good? Ready for this? Friends, would you give God thanks for the gift you have in your neighbors by standing and greeting one another? <laughs> Thank you. 
morning. Oh, you have a lot to share today, don't you? <laughs> My name is Polly Rowan, and I will be your worship leader this morning. Please join me in our opening prayer. Holy Lord, your followers gave to your children something more powerful and more valuable than riches. They gave healing and hope, bringing healing and hope into our world and show us evidence of your presence in our lives. Hi again. I did a bad job and I didn't ask anyone to be the song leader, so will you sing with me? <laughs> our opening hymn, number 400, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Director of Children and Family Ministries, and I'd like to invite the children to come on up for the children's moment. have ever had to be carried somewhere. I mean, like when you're a little baby, you had to be carried around right before you could walk. But there might have been another time you had to be carried somewhere. When my daughter was six, a cement bench fell on her toe and broke it, and she had to be carried around until she got some crutches. If someone has to be carried around, they're pretty dependent on other people because they can't get up and do for themselves. <laughs> In Bible times, the people did not have the help of some of the things that we have the help of today, like a wheelchair or crutches or even glasses. I would be bad off without my glasses, so I'm grateful for them. Our lesson today tells a story about a man who was lame. Lame means he couldn't walk. He wasn't able to walk his whole life from the time he was born, and he had to be carried everywhere. He couldn't go anywhere without somebody carrying him, mm -hmm. a grown man. And since he was unable to walk, 
he was unable to work and make a living. So he would sit in front of the temple and he would beg for money, anybody that would give him some money. And that's how he had money to get food to eat or anything else he needed it for. Well, when two of Jesus' disciples, John and Peter, walked by, they saw the man begging. And Peter told him, he, he said, even though I don't have silver or gold to give you, I am going to give you all that I have. And in the name of Jesus, Peter healed the man. And the man jumped up, and all of a sudden, his feet and his ankles and his legs, he could move them all. He could walk, he could jump, and he could praise God. It was a miracle. And Peter did that in the name of Jesus. Can't you just imagine how excited he was? Yeah, he jumped and he danced and he praised God. He was so thankful. And the next part of the story is wonderful too. What happened was that people all around saw this man who had never been able to walk, and all of a sudden he's walking, he's praising God, He's dancing around. It was a miracle, and people saw that. And Peter told them about Jesus. And the number of people who believed in Jesus got bigger and bigger and bigger. Pretty wow, isn't it? Yeah. And, and God wants us to help people. And even if we can't give them money or things, we can usually do something to help them. Maybe we can hold the door for them or push a wheelchair or maybe a friend, maybe there's a friend that other people have made fun of and we could be nice to that friend and we could be a friend to that friend. And most importantly, we can pray for them and we can tell them about Jesus. God used Peter to teach people about Jesus and God uses us too. Let's pray. Dear God, Dear God, we ask you to be with those in need. We ask you to be with those in need. And we praise you for miracles. And we praise you for miracles. Please help us help others. Please help us help others. And tell them about Jesus. And tell them about Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, let's go to Sunday school. Rebecca King, I'm the youth director here, and I would like to invite 6th grade through 12th grade to also be dismissed to Sunday school. We'll walk over to the doghouse, and then kids can uh, just meet y'all at the cars afterwards. Thank you. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Lord, Lord. Open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our first scripture this morning is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses 53 and 56. When they had crossed over, they came to a land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about at the whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into the villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplace and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. Our second scripture is from the book of Acts. And it should sound familiar to you since it was our children's message. <laughs> but we'll hear it again. As it's in the book of Acts, chapter 3. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And a man, lame from birth, was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple, called the Beautiful Gate 
so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him and asked at John and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up. He stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. And they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Good morning again. Good morning. Today we are recognizing Organ Donation Sunday, and so that's something you'll be learning a little more about as we go on through our service. Uh, but that's why I had you talking to one another about something someone has given you. Um, it can be something that personal, but it can also be a story that brings new life to you, an insight, an example, uh, some sort of support. And so I just want you to be mindful of that theme as we proceed this morning. Let us pray. Holy God, thank you for so loving this world that you gave your only son. Won't you transplant his new life into us that we might in turn share it with others for it never runs out. Amen. Good Lord. I, I can't believe it. You see this guy? Yeah, bouncing everywhere in the temple. He's eager and smiling, <laughs> energized like an innocent child. Can you remember that kind of energy in here ever? Where whoever he is, he's loving every minute. <laughs> I wish I had that verb. Me too. Hold on. That's Joe. What? Yeah, it's Joe. What do you mean it's Joe? I just dropped him off at the gate. Joe! It's Joe. <laughs> it's Joe. I can't believe it. I can't either. Praise God. Praise God. He was full of surprises. <laughs> That's the right woman for the job. <laughs> So friends, we do this because we want you to have a sense of the scene at the 9 o'clock prayer hour at the temple. It is a scene of great surprise. A man who had never been able to walk was leaping, dancing, fully healed. Now, this man might not have been born with feet for walking, but what he had was neighbors, right? These neighbors who carry him to the temple gate every time they're able. And a lot of commentators make much about not knowing this person's name. And I think there's a, a reason they haven't thought of for that. I think we don't know the person's name. I call the person Joe. But we don't know the name because in not knowing it, we learn a lot about Peter and a lot about us. So maybe this character holds up a mirror for us, but they carry this character to the temple gates every time. So that means the, the neighbors who were in the temple, who were seeing this happen, they knew the name. They, in fact, knew his weight because they carried him. They knew his schedule because they were his schedule. They knew his home and his family. They knew his smell. They knew him so well, and they love him. And by giving their time and their strength and their resources for him to live on, they are his feet and they are his home. And so there are a lot of blessings here in the life of this man, born lame. And yet, when he's leaping in the temple, imagine whether they were able to recognize him as first. So unfamiliar are his movements. Yeah. <laughs> When they finally realize who's jumping with joy, the surprise of it leaves them amazed and wonderstruck. How does this happen? They must have been thinking. Because they know they're seeing something that's more than money can do. More than their time and strength can do. They're seeing the true power of God. When we see healings in the Bible, we are seeing an inbreaking of the kingdom of God, giving us a picture of what is yet to come. And so feet and ankles are set right. These unused muscles for a whole life are energized. Never used balance in this fellow is made strong, all without physical therapy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
And the man has dance moves at the ready. I know you do. So no human has done this. So how does this kind of new life get in somebody? Now Peter is involved in this surprise. And Peter knows it's not his own doing. All Peter does is what all the other neighbors have done. Some of them gave their time. Some of them gave their money. And Peter does what they've done. He gives what he has. But what was it that Peter had? Peter says to the man, I don't have silver or gold, which means technically the lame man was richer than Peter because he surely had collected some by then. But I don't have silver or gold, but what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk, and the man gets up and jumps around. So what did Peter give him? Power is is one good answer, some kind of power. Another good answer might be specifically the power of Jesus, since since the name of Jesus is called upon. I want you to be guessing and wondering, what did he give? Faith? A word of faith? The courage to to try and step out anew since he says, stand up? I think all of these are pretty decent answers as to what Peter gave, but I think there's one more thing, something very personal to Peter, that he has given. And and this lame man jumping around kind of holds up the mirror to what that is. Because the man who was born lame is free from that limitation in his body. And what does that have in common with Peter? Freedom. And so I want to suggest to you that one of the ways to understand this scripture is that Peter has offered the same freedom in Jesus that he himself has. It might not manifest in the same way in body, but perhaps freedom is what both men share, one offering the freedom of Christ to another. Peter is free because Jesus gave him a surprise, a transplant, a piece of his own life given into Peter's life. And so to help folks know how that could be true, let's go into Peter's backstory a little bit. When we first meet Peter in the Bible, we meet him as this bold fellow, so much so that Jesus lifts him up constantly as an example. Peter is a leader. He is quick to speak up, quick to take risks, quick to make promises. And when it matters most, right as Jesus goes to the cross, Do you remember what happens? Yeah, Peter fails. He ends up denying Jesus, not once, not twice, but three three times. Now, Peter, time and again, was sure that he could follow Jesus wherever Jesus would go, but it turns out he couldn't do it. And so Peter has, in that way, a lameness all his own. He couldn't walk all the way where Jesus walked, but he couldn't before his failure, see that about himself. He couldn't admit that he was capable of failure. But when he was compared to the trials that were set before him, it turns out that his courage was cardboard. Jesus warned him that this was going to happen, but Peter was so full of pride and arrogance, he, he didn't believe Jesus, he believed his own bluster, right? He needed help, but he didn't know he needed it. He couldn't know it. He was too busy believing his own press releases. One wonders what would have been different if Peter didn't feel such a need to build up his own ego. What if Peter had been humble enough to listen to Jesus and ask for a strength stronger than his own? What if Peter had been vulnerable enough to cry for help from God when fearsome things were yet to come? 
But instead of those possibilities, Peter had to hit rock bottom his own to see his need clearly. And for Peter, that meant hearing Jesus' warning, before the cock crows twice, you're going to deny me three times, and then disregarding that warning, experiencing that horrible deja vu as he finds himself actually doing what Jesus said he would do, denying Jesus for the third time as that bird sings the second time. Only in that moment does Peter's image of himself fizzle and his feet of clay come into focus. In that moment, he can begin to see his own unfreedom, his own lameness. Jesus was made lame on the cross by the powers of sin and death. He rose on the third day. And it's free to walk, free to leap, free to dance, free to live God's way in the world forever. Rising to transplant a real freedom from sin and death into us, giving us freedom from the ravages of our egos, from our fears, our illnesses, unto death. Freedom to live in the power and love of God. Freedom to heal and freedom to grow. And I suggest to you that Peter was one of Jesus' first new life transplant recipients. When Jesus rose from the dead, Peter must have been so ashamed to be in his presence. But what does Jesus say to him? He says, Peter, do you love me? And And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus says, then feed my sheep. And it happens two more times. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my sheep. He gets to say this three times. It's a second chance to say what he wanted to say, what he believed he could say all on his own while that cock was crowing. But he couldn't do it all his own. But with Jesus there, loving and forgiving him, he had a new strength. In that conversation, Jesus transplanted a freedom into Peter, and he did it by seeing him and forgiving him and enabling him to stand up, not just in his own strength, but in the love of Jesus. Stand up and start walking, this time humbly, with Jesus. How do you imagine Peter felt on the inside? Beanie? Dancing. I can't dance. That's why we had you do it. I know where to stand and what to do. <laughs> and so I want you to see this jumping and dancing of the lame man healed, holding up a mirror of the freedom Peter has inside. Now, friends, some transplants we can give to ourselves. Just a doctor's help. We can have banked blood to give back to ourselves. We can experience bone grafts, but we cannot give ourselves a new kidney, a new heart, a new liver. For such things, someone else, what they have, they need to give us. When Jesus gave Peter a piece of his own life, Peter could live in Jesus' footsteps through the power of Jesus living in him. Lame on his own, he could walk with Jesus. And then when Peter sees this man who is lame, this new life he has of Jesus in him, this freedom Peter has, he gives like a transplant of the new life he has in Jesus into this man. And this leaping shows us that Jesus' new life in us makes all the difference. We sometimes get tripped up on this. We get very literal with this. And the early church fathers would look at that first literal layer, and they would see somebody experience a physical healing. 
And they would expect to see that from time to time. But they would also look at the next layer, a symbolic layer, because that kind of healing might be happening in more than one way, not just in ankles, but maybe in some deeper part of us that needs to be set free. And so they knew it to be a sign of God's inbreaking kingdom, which we don't know fully, but it's coming. And this is a sign of what's yet to come. It's about more than ankles. It's about the freedom and new life that Jesus brings this man who is holding up a mirror to Peter and the freedom he has, but also a mirror to us. Friends, there are two invitations for us this morning that we find in the scripture. The first invitation is when the man born lame holds that mirror up to us because his need is obvious, right? It's right there where everyone can see it. He has a visible need, and some of us have a visible need. But all of us have invisible needs. Can you let yourself this morning sit with the lame man? Can you see his ankles curled up, ankles that have kept him from walking? And can you let yourself, as you're sitting next to him, be honest about what makes it hard for you to put one foot in front of the other? Peter couldn't admit his need at first. But when he sees this man whose need is right out there, it must have struck a chord with him. When our need is out there, we can finally seek help for it. Can you let your need be known? Can you tell Jesus where you need help? Because surprise, that help and that freedom is ready for you. Maybe in your body, maybe in your thoughts, your actions, your experience, your freedom from isolation, your need to be freed from fear. Friends, I want you to think about this first invitation. Maybe this is how Jesus is calling you today, to name a need, as the prelude of giving you the surprise of strength to keep walking or walk anew with Jesus' heart, mind, strength, spirit in you, and you in him. Hard to get a transplant before a diagnosis. The second invitation we find in Peter. Early in his life, he had know-how and strength, his own, that he relied on. But later in life, he accepted that he can't be everything. He can't be all things. And he doesn't have to be enough alone. And he began to live out of his brokenness. Friends, we are stronger when we can admit our weakness, and we are wiser when we understand what we don't know. So maybe in your life you've hit your rock bottom and you've learned to lean on Jesus as your rock instead. Maybe you have experienced this freedom of new life living in you, allowing you to walk and jump and leap. If so, then perhaps this second invitation is for you. If it is, then hold on to Peter's words. I don't have silver, I don't have gold, but what I have, I give you. If you have this new life in you, this healing, this transplant from Christ in you, then you can give it. What you have, you can give. I mean, it's vital that we give our time. It's life-sustaining that we give our gifts. But friends, God might be calling you to give your story of new life, your story of freedom, the story of Christ's heart transplanted in you. There's no fear in us sharing out of that new life and transplanting it into someone else because this transplant of freedom in Christ, it never fails, and it's never used up. It only grows in the sharing. Perhaps you have new life to give. Thanks be to God for the surprise 
of this freedom. Now there's a way to take somewhere in your pews, in your rows somewhere, maybe passed down, is an RSVP between you and your pastors. And you put your name at the top and contact information. You can use it as an individual or as a family. And you can check one box or two boxes. That's up to you. But maybe you are at a place in your life where you feel the need to get free. I find that this kind of happens in onion layers for me. I'll, I'll experience the freedom of Christ in one part of my life, and then I truck down the road a couple years, and I have to get to a deeper layer and a deeper layer of letting myself see how unfree I was and learn to admit a need to get free. And so maybe that's you. If it is, that that's God's invitation for you today. Check that one. But perhaps you're feeling like, I'm not feeling too tangled up right now. That is okay. So for you, you might have a freedom to share. And you might say to yourself, well, I'm not like Peter. I don't have some horrific regret. And that's okay. If you were raised in the church and you just have always leaned on Jesus, you surely have a story of how that faith that you have walked in all these many years has helped you through a hard time. And somebody else that didn't have that will benefit from your story. Because otherwise, how do they know what it looks like? It's sort of like when you learn to ride a bike and you say, am I doing it? Am I doing it? Somebody has to stand there and say, you got it. And sometimes when we're practicing living, leaning on Jesus, we do wonder, is, it, is this it? Am I doing it right? And as we share our stories of how we found freedom and new life in Christ, we are a help to one another. So we have an opportunity to be these two folks. And what we're going to do with this is Beanie and I are going to receive this and pray over it. And some of you that maybe check the first box, we're going to reach out to you and offer a chance to gather in a small group or in pastoral care to talk about how God's calling you to get free. Others are going to be called together and a chance to learn how to share their faith story in a way that transplants hope others. And if you're both, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll pray about what to do. And we will get you in one opportunity or another. But you will find that the Peter that is needed is in this room for everybody who feels like your ankles are weak. Why don't you give God the opportunity to use you this week? Thank you, Chris. Praise kids at heart. Will you stand as children of God and sing with me again hymn number 141, Children of the Heavenly Father.
pray. Lord, help us to be humble. Help us to be honest with you, to ask for the strength we need, the healing that we need. Help us to be bold, to be bold in sharing the freedom that we have in Christ. Help us to be able to stand up and dance about the love that we feel, the grace that we receive. Lord, on this Transplant Sunday, we thank you for those who are organ donors. We thank you for all the lives that have been saved by that. And so may we remember that, that you, you are the author of our lives, and you are the strength we have. And now let us pray the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. To guide us on this uh, Transplant Organ Donation Sunday, I give you Beth Lighthizer. Yeah, come on. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? So like Chris said, my name is Beth Lighthizer. Um, my husband Joe and I have been members here at Shady Grove since 2013, and she asked me to come talk to y'all today about how organ donation has impacted our family. Back in 2017, our son Graham was born very sick with multiple heart defects. We spent the first month of his life at CHKD in Norfolk, and then we were transferred to UVA Children's for Graham to be evaluated and placed on the transplant list. We got to come home for a little bit, but ultimately his heart failure worsened and turned into total cardiomyopathy. His only chance of survival at this point was a transplant. Graham received his hero heart at just four months old. He's now a thriving six-year-old who's about to finish kindergarten. When he was born, we truly didn't know how much time we'd have together, but on April 30th, we get to celebrate six years of this gift beating in his chest. Chris came to visit us many times throughout our hospital stays, and we were so fortunate to have her be with us as Graham was in surgery. We prayed together, and she asked each of us to tell her how we were feeling at that moment. Hope is the word that came to mind for me. Because someone chose to donate, donate their child's organs, their child's heart to our child, we now had hope for a future together. That's what organ donation does. It gives the gift of life, and there is nothing greater one can give. There are over 100,000 people currently listed on the transplant list. 86% of those are waiting on a kidney. Organ donation can be done through both deceased donation or living donation. And I want to um, dispel some myths about deceased donation. Organ donation from a deceased donor is only considered when someone has suffered brain death. Being registered as an organ donor does not change the quality of care a patient receives. Most deceased donors have passed from a stroke, heart attack, or a severe head injury. By choosing to be an organ and tissue donor, one person can save up to eight people and improve the lives of 75 others. It's also possible for someone to be a living donor by choosing to donate an organ or part of an organ to someone waiting typically a kidney or part of one's liver. Living donation can be done in three different ways. Directed donation is where someone gives their organ directly to a friend, relative, or someone in need that they've been made aware of. Paired donation happens when two or more pairs of living donors swap to make compatible matches for their loved ones. And non-directed donation is donating an organ without naming a recipient. 
prepared and directed donation, donors will follow protocols set by the transplant center in which the recipient is a patient. To be a non-directed donor, one can contact local transplant hospitals to inquire about their programs and the next steps forward. Typically, this looks like filling out a questionnaire and undergoing a medical screening. The three closest to us here are VCU, um, which does uh, kidney and liver, Henrico Doctors, which does kidney, and then UVA, which does liver and kidneys. Links to these programs, as well as the National Donate Life Registry, are provided on a handout you can get on your way out, um, along with some other goodies from the United Network of Organ Sharing um, after the service. It's easy for me to stand up here and gush about the receiving end of organ donation. We've gotten to experience the joy of watching our son grow, but it's not lost on us that Graham gets to live while someone else's child does not. When Graham was first listed for transplant at just six weeks old, the first person I told, after our families of course, was my friend Christina. I met Christina at my first teaching job where we taught seventh grade together. She and I instantly bonded, and as I grew to know her, I learned that she had lost her son, Joe, just a few months shy of his ninth birthday. I asked Christina to write a little something for me to share with you today about the giving side of organ donation. Here are her words. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to share a bit about our sweet Joseph, who unexpectedly became an organ donor at the age of eight and a half on January 2nd, 2010, due to an undiagnosed AVM. In June of 2009, I had to break the news to my sons of their great aunt Kathy passing away. At that moment, both of my boys brought up organ donation and how if anything ever happened to them to take everything but their eyes so they could see what was going on up there in heaven. Not seven months later before Joe turned nine, he became an organ donor. He successfully donated both kidneys, his liver, and his pancreas. His unexpected death threw our family into a state of crisis and turmoil. In those moments of utter destruction, the one thing we knew for sure was that our boy wanted to be an organ donor. When we were approached by Donate Life, we knew without a doubt that we would donate everything we could except his eyes. In those raw moments, his literal words were the law we abided by. With our earthly eyes and understanding, we wanted him to have his eyes so he could see heaven. As the years have passed, we are certain he would have wanted us to donate those as well. But in the midst of reconciling that your beautiful child will not be coming back to you, their words become the literal path of honor and legacy. There have been many dark hours over the years, as anyone who has lost a child understands. But the fact that Joe's unexpected death gave others a new lease on life, another day, a second chance, is always our guiding light. We have even had the pleasure of meeting one of his recipients, and we all felt God's presence in this reunion. I could share synchronicities that could not be explained in any other way than our boy lives on through his organ recipients. One of our favorite things is his recipient who got his right kidney always refers to it as Little Joe. Each Christmas card or Easter card is signed with love from her name and Little Joe. She has gotten an additional 14 years of life with more on the horizon because they were such a good match. She has become a grandmother twice over, traveled to Costa Rica, and developed a nightly love of ice cream. If you know our Joe, his sweet tooth was notorious. She blames him for her newfound sweet tooth. <laughs> I don't pretend to know the bigger plan here, but I do know that because of his organ donations, we have been able to heal as a family. We have been able to cre per create purpose out of pain. We have been able to continue to journey through this life yesterday, today, tomorrow, next week, and beyond, creating a butterfly effect of love and opportunity. Each one of us has the chance to send forth a tiny ripple of hope each day, a smile, a kind word, a held door, thank you, or any other selfless act. It is easy to make a difference, both big and small. Joe made a difference, and you can too. We cherish every memory of our sweet Joe and miss him terribly, but Joe's star shines brightly and beautifully and is an ever-present beacon that keeps us moving steadily forward with strength, purpose, love, and ultimately awareness of the life-saving opportunity of organ donation. And by life-saving, I mean for both the recipients and the donor families. Thank you for allowing me to share our beautiful boy who made the ultimate sacrifice. Please consider registering to be an organ donor or volunteering for Donate Life Virginia or UNOS, which are both amazing nonprofit organizations. 
I will leave you with this thought. I believe sweet Joe's life exemplifies John chapter 15, verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Thank you for listening about our Joe and our story as a donor family. Christina Armstead, Tripp and Joe's mom forever. I also want to thank you for giving me a chance to come up here and speak today and for listening to her story and ours. To be perfectly honest, I don't think um, Joe and I completely comprehend it all or that we ever will. Um, there are so many questions we have, mainly why does Graham get to live when someone else's child doesn't? It's not a question we'll ever know the answer to, but we do get to live each day knowing full well how beautiful this life can be, how fortunate we are to take the breaths we take, and how wonderful it is to serve a Lord who can take the most broken parts of this world and use them to create something whole again. Thank you. What a beautiful message. <laughs> Jesus said, don't be like the hypocrites, but to tithe with love of God in your heart. And that's how it should be an intimate offering to him. So today, when we give, let us give as an act of love to God, simply because we love him. And you may generously give as the ushers pass the plates by you and place your offerings, or you can uh, go online and text S-E-R-V-E to 73256 or to give to shadygroveumc.net slash give.
join me in the prayer of dedication. Hallelujah, O resurrected Christ. We celebrate this Easter season, the promise for all time of your unending gifts of celebration. Make them be celebration. We praise your holy name. And so, church, renewed with the faith, renewed with the power of God and the influence of those like Peter, will you join in the singing of our closing hymn, number 571, as we go into our world to make all disciples. <laughs> to get to know you a little bit better and ask that you stop by our welcome desk on your right as you head out. We've got some fantastic upcoming mission opportunities. Uh, next Sunday, we are invited to prepare and serve dinner to 30 to 35 men at Liberation Veterans Services. That is next week. If you'd like to know more information,